so I'll just leave it here. So, with, with that ado, we'll, I'd like to get started. Um, our first speaker today is um, known as KK, which I think is a bit easier to say. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but uh, perhaps you pronounce your own name? Yeah, okay, so my name is Kosuke. That's the actual my name in Japanese. But, right, yeah. and uh, he's going to talk to us about the Jenkins community. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I am from, I'm Kosuke, I'm from the Jenkins project. I guess I'm the creator of the project. I don't know how many of you here know what Jenkins is, so I... Um, <laughs> thank you. So it's a, well, the, just briefly, it's a Java web application that's used for automating builds and tests and all kinds of other things. And in software like this is typically called continuous integration server. It's under a MIT license, and it's been around for about eight years. So it's all in all, it's a pretty popular project nowadays. Uh, we track about 53,000 installations around the world. Um, and um, to enrich this ecosystem is the 600 plus plugins that's developed by more than 500 people around the world. And then that puts us the most adapted continuous integration server on the market. So while in this conference there's a lot of big open source projects, so I, I guess it, perhaps it might be a bit arrogant to ask ourselves, you know, why Jenkins was able to come this far. Um, but, you know, there's, but, but yeah, but I guess I, I, I'd like to think that the Jenkins has, has, has attained certain amount of adoption, which I'm very proud of. And there's obviously the usual things that I think contributed to this success, which is like, you know, actually producing the software that works, at least most of the time, um, or simply being at the right place at the right time. I think there's definitely that aspect as well. But at the same time, I'd like to think that there are certain key ingredients in the way we created the community that sort of is, in my view, it's broadly applicable to other open source projects. So my goal here today is to talk about some of these things that I think it really worked well for us in the hope that the you know, people here, presumably running your own open source projects, will be able to pick up some of the ideas. So, um, the, I think the, the whole thing, sort of, the, my, the, the way we design communities sort of start with this realization is that the, community, the communication is inherently painful. The fact that I'm struggling to sort of give this presentation is the uh, proof enough that the communication is painful. It, because, or, but if you think about how the contribution to the open source project typically works, it, it goes something like this. Right? You first have to, if you're working on any non-trivial change, you probably first to ask the people running the project to see if they are willing to take it. And then once, you, know, you have to sell the idea that why it's, why it's useful beyond you and whatnot. And once they are okay, you actually have to start working on the change. And then once the code is done, you have to also defend that patch. Right? There are different things people can you know, do to implement the same thing. Maybe the project wants you to write the test and documentations. You might have to give in certain aspects to rewrite some of the patch because the existing committer didn't like some aspects of it, even though it might be working okay for you. So all in all, it adds to a lot of work. And then, you know, no doubt that some people get dissuaded from all these things that they have to do to get what they want to do. And beyond that, I think the programmers are very sort of picky people. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong when we try to communicate. You know, like, Sometimes it's simple things like the indentations and coding conventions, and I know some people get really upset when the patch doesn't follow these things. But there's also lots of things reasonable people can disagree about, you know, in the design, of how they anticipate the future extensions, whether they, you know, whether they think the performance is important to trump over the cleanliness of the code and so on. So again, all these things adds up to the additional overhead when you're talking about having other people contribute. And in a, in negotiating this kind of thing is painful enough even when you know the people that you're working in, like in the corporate setup, but it's downright impossible when you sort of have to work in the context of the open source project when you just don't know each other. You know, we don't have any context around us outside the coding. We don't know, we don't know what food they like, we don't know how they look, we don't know, you know how many ch children they might have, and so on. 
we sometimes don't even have common goals. Um, we might have some rough ideas about where the project should be, but people might have disagreement over this. We definitely don't have any command structures. You can't simply ask, I mean, tell someone else to do something. Even as I lead in the project, I don't get to tell other people in the Jenkins community to do this or do that. I have to sort of influence more carefully. And then on top of that, there's all these things like the time zone differences and language differences that adds up to the, the pain of the communication. So if I, make a bold, if I may make a bold statement, I even dare say that the communication is in fact the root of all the pains or the, all the evil in the open source projects. So in my mind, the less the communication is better. If you can get the same thing done with less communication, that's better. And so the, what we did really sort of try to make happen in the Jenkins project is like what can we do to reduce the need for the communications? Right? The, it's, a, it's a realization that we don't want to stand in the, in the way between people who came up with the ideas to their implementations. If someone is crazy enough to you know, invest their own time to implement some feature on top of, say, Jenkins, I'd rather just have them do it without me getting in the way for, in terms of the code review or the design or the discussions. And I think it's also the realization that the innovations happen everywhere, not just existing among the existing community members. And so the least we can do is to try not to stifle them by forcing them to do more than they have to. So henceforth, I think my, in my mind, the question is, well, you know, we still want to be collaborating in the sense of generally heading to the same direction, at least similar directions. But how can we do that without forcing communication? Or how can we do that without, with as minimal communication as possible? Right? So that's sort of like what, what, I, what I really wanted to put into the Jenkins project. And I think it starts with the modularity. That is, you know, when you have the large piece of software decomposed into smaller chunks that can be individually built and tested and so on. And then if these things are nicely, reasonably shielded behind the contracts, and then if each people can work within their own module, that, that certainly reduces the communication overhead. And then that's good. But this alone is not enough. That, but the reason I, you know, I, I appreciate the modularity is because it gives rise to the extensibility, which is the, the main thing that I want to talk about today. It's sort of the modularity taken to the next level where your code gets opened up to the rest of the world. And then, so that's how the other people could come in and then write stuff without, without you doing things. And you know, if, if there's one word that I'd like you to take away from my talk, that would be this extensibility. I think this really is the only thing that, that matters. Because this is the one that enables all kinds of social tricks and engineering tricks that we put in the Jenkins project. I think as long as your project had some of these, I think you should be able to do just the same. And we spend a lot of time doing this, uh, creating this proper infrastructure to enable extensibility. This investment was certainly not free, but it was definitely worth it. And that with everything else in the open source community, these things can come over time. You don't have to do everything in one go. So I think there's a many facets to extensibility, so I wanted to sort of talk about some of these. I think the one that I think of, the first one that I think of, is the, the programmability. It's, the, it's being able to sort of use any software as a library, not just, you know, not just by humans. Um, that it's a realization that there's always a layer above your program that's trying to drive your program. And I think it's obvious for library projects that because that's the main use case, but for the applications, people seem to tend to forget that. The worst offender in my, like, like one, one bad example, one offender example that I can think of would be Gmail. Right? They don't really let you tweak their UI. You can't really have like, you know, the add-ons or anything that's working with Gmail. They might have IMAP integration, but that's basically it. And another example might be the GIMP example. I mean, it's a, it's a graphic manipulation application, and it does have some command line capability, but it's not really not enough to the point that it gave rise to this whole software in the community known as the image magic. The, another important part of the extensibility, I think, is this ability to load code at runtime. You know, it, it's, it's bas it basically involves in defining some contracts, so these extension points so that allows other people to hook into, 
And then, you know, that might be the abstract base classes. It might be set of methods that have certain names, whatever that is, depending on languages. In some languages, this is really easy. Like, you know, descriptive languages, loading code at the runtime is like there's, I mean, every code gets loaded at the runtime. But for some other languages, this is actually not as easy as, as it might sound, like, uh, say, Java or C. And then ideally, we'd like to provide some isolation between these. I think the, the, bad, the, the offender that I can think of that does not offer the code loading capability would be the iTunes. You know, they have a programmability, but you can't really tweak the iTunes UI by adding stuff into it. Right? So in that sense, the thing you can do with iTunes is limited. The another important aspect of the extensibility, I think, is, is to treat extensions as the first class citizens. It, it, it should, the user shouldn't be able to distinguish between what's provided by the core versus what's provided by the extensions. In fact, it's so much so that in Jenkins project, if there's something that the core can do that's not possible for plugins to do, then that's almost considered as a bug. Right? So this, and because this, this allows the sort of plugins to you know, be essentially, we have the infinite amount of capability. So the, the, I guess the offender in, in my dictionary in this respect would be the Outlook. So they do have the programmable API, they have the, um, uh, they have the ability to load code at the runtime, but the, the thing you can do in Outlook is actually substantially limited for the add-ons. They can only add stuff into this add-in pane, not to any other ribbon bars. So you can, you, know, you can immediately tell which is a core functionality and which is not. And then so it creates this discrimination between these things. And so that's, in my mind, it's doing, not doing good enough. And yet another part of the extensibility, the, the data model extensibility. Um, so th this is because the extensions need to be able to store the, data, store the stuff, just like the core does. So in a way, it's a logical extension of the, the previous principle that I mentioned. You know, sometimes it's about adding additional data to the existing core domain models. Like, say, in Jenkins project, you can, uh, if you install a GitHub plugin, you can associate the GitHub project to the, to the Jenkins job. So that's an example of storing things. And then also, the extension needs to be able to define their own domain, of, domain objects, and just like what the core has. And this is kind of really tricky um, in many domains, like especially the web applications. And um, you know, being an XML guy in my formal life, I find the XML really useful here because the X in XML is extensibility. It's really good at storing this kind of random semi-structured data. And, I've, and I think this, this, another place this imposes challenge, I think, is the database schema. Um, you no longer have a linear evolutions. You have all these core versions and the, every plugin has their own versions, right? So managing the, uh, the schema consistent with the versions of the plugin in place, I think, would be major work. The, about, uh, yet another part, I'm not sure how to sort of the, phrase this nicely, it, I think it's the, the notion that the, you want to embrace the heterogeneousness of some things. Right? It's the, because the, if you have a good contract, a good contract should enable different implementations that satisfy the same bar. It's so often what people want to do is to you know, take something that already exists and slightly tweak its behavior to their taste and then make it something new that can be used with the rest of the software. Um, and then so in other words, like whenever we see a list, I see a list in something, you know, like I guess the apps in the Google apps. I mean, this is like the, the example of the heterogeneousness that we want to have. We want people to be able to add one more things in here. And if, if possible, by taking one of the existing stuff and slightly modifying it. And then so that's where the inheritance is coming to play. And again, this, I find it surprisingly tricky to get this right in many contexts. Like, you know, for example, in the web app, the controller logic normally doesn't really appreciate this kind of heterogeneousness or the polymorphism. So providing a different UI for those different concepts and so on, it's not, it's not very easy. So this is, one place, this is one of the places where I spend a lot of efforts in the Jenkins to, to make possible. And again, if you take these earlier principles to the logical conclusions that the extensions are the first class citizens, you also need to make sure that the, 
the extensions by themselves could provide additional contracts to allow other extensions to hook into. In other words, it's like a, the extensibility all the way down um, to, the, to the virtual machine. So in Jenkins, to enable that, we provide an idiom that allows extensions to use it. That's the same idiom that the core uses to define extension point. And I think the part of this is cultural. We sort of, people aren't used to the notion of defining these extension points unless sort of they are pushed into. So we had to do some hand folding initially. And I think that partly this is a everlasting refactoring work. Um, a good example that I can think of is in Jenkins, you know, one of the functionality it has is whenever a new commit shows up in, say, some version repository, we want to start a new build. And one day, a patch showed up that said, well, we have actually Jenkins making some commits. And then, so if those commits trigger a new build, it's going to cause the infinite cycles. So we want to be able to ignore certain commits if that come from certain user. You know, sounded like a reasonable request, so we added it. And a few months later, the, another part came along that, well, we like this idea of the extension, ex exclusions, but instead of using username, we are, we'd like to exclude certain path. And next thing you know, somebody, somebody else came up that, well, if you have some tokens in the commit message, that's what we want to ignore. And so you know, pretty soon, we have like three or four different ways to exclude some commits. And then that's when we realized that, oh, this should have been the extension points. And so there are lots of these examples that initially we couldn't really anticipate that people wanted to plug things in. And so we, should, we still need to be able to do so after the fact. And so the, the continuing this effort would help you create this extensibility turtle recursions. And while I still can't really put my fingers on exactly what the extensibility is, that's why I had to resort to naming some of these key things. But I, it's also easy to tell what's the sign of the fake extensibility or the fake modularity, as I call it. Right? Um, the, the first one, I think, is, the, is that the division of labor alone is not enough of a modularity. Um, I see that in, a, in most of the big projects, in many big, well, in, in any non-trivial software project, you have more people than, say, you have multiple people involved in the project. So they have to divide up the labor, which means certain kind of well, the contract would have to emerge between those people's boundaries. But that alone is, does not create good enough modularity because um, the, what the often happens is that you end up creating this contract that actually custom tailor fit just for these two modules that does not possibly allow any other implementations. Um, so again, I used to work on these, one of these large projects in my previous life at Sun Microsystems. And I was in this group that does the web services, and then there are the people doing the, you know, the initialization sequence, the load application code, right? So we have to hook into the web app, the web services initialization to what they do, so we have to develop some contract, but um, it, the end result is that the, you know, the, the contract that we created was really just for the web services, and it couldn't be used for any other purposes. And that's, that doesn't really, that just doesn't cut it. And I think, when, come to think of it, um, I think one of the things that fosters that kind of the uh, environment is sort of the implicit assumption that you have this fixed set of modules that becomes the final product, that no one else is not adding anything at the runtime. Right? Because if the whole thing consists of a certain known number of modules, and then if you know, if you know these people, then they, they are the ones that you're working with, then, I mean, you, you start to, you, you fail to see the point of defining these general abstract concepts that is the contract that goes actually beyond what you might immediately need. And so you end up just creating something that works between you and the other guy in the other side of the, co the corridor. So in Jenkins, the way, we, the, the way it works is we have a core which sort of creates the bare bone structure of being a CI server. Um, unfortunately, it's still pretty big, like, so that's why I put the sun there. I wish this was smaller and all, but I think this, as, we, as with the case with most of the other software, initially Jenkins wasn't particularly extensible, right? So I mean, these things came over time, so by then we had sufficient amount of accumulation that 
preventing us from proper changes, proper modularizations. But at the same time, the internally, this, this big chunk of mass is actually divided up into smaller pieces, they called modules. And then, that's the, technically speaking, these things are the same as the plugins. It's just that they cannot be uninstalled. Um, and then, but around the core, uh, the, to revolve around the core are the, the planets, that's the 600 plus plugins. And these are the ones that actually provide the functionalities that's useful for uh, the users. And then that's what, we make, that what makes Jenkins the CI server. So I think with that kind of gimmick, I think now I think I'm ready to answer the question that I posed out here, that is, you know, how can we collaborate with as minimal communication as possible? And with that communication, if it's even feasible. And that is to create these, all these silos that's, and then that's it's be harnessed by the extensibility. We want to divide everyone up into the small sandbox, the little silo that they are happy with, but somehow they can be put together to form the whole software. And normally the silo, I think, is sort of talked in the context of something bad, but you know, I, I'd argue that the silo equipped with extensibility is a good thing um, because first, it sort of forces the contracts at the boundary, which is one of the foundation for enabling collaboration with that high degree of communications. Right? When you have, when, you, when individual silos are small enough, it's, it, it becomes a lot easier to keep the generalized contracts that prevents these custom fit module contracts that only work between two guys. And this is, I guess it's a manifestation of the principle of the continuous X things, like if you find something painful, you, you just do it frequently enough and often enough, and then it becomes a part of your work, part of, the, part of your daily life. So if the defining contrast or defining abstraction is too painful, you just do it all the time, and then like, do it at the every possible boundaries, and then that makes it easier. And of course, the smaller code, when you have a s individual silos that's smaller, the smaller code is easier to work on and easier to hack, most of the Jenkins plugins it probably consists of less than a dozen files, and each of the files aren't particularly big. So for someone new to the Jenkins ecosystem that's thinking about tweaking the behavior of certain things, it's a lot easier to look at, say, you know, five files as opposed to like a massive 500 file project. It's just easier to comprehend, easier to build, easier to test, you know, easier to run, and so on. I think the another important aspect of creating silos is that it allows you to sort of embrace all these special use cases that without sort of cluttering the general purpose code. I think the one of the reasons that people have to discuss about the future designs is because there's always this tension between these special purpose, special use case that only serves small number of people from the general things that should be, you know, should be, should be kept. And so, you know, this, when, we could, when we could accommodate these special use cases in a different silo, and then only, you know, only those who need it is gonna use it, then it eliminates one of the reasons why you need to have such a heated discussion about what's to be added in the future. So, you know, if you didn't have the extensibility, extensibility in Jenkins, adding these half a dozen different ways to exclude commits in the subversion plugin might not have been feasible because, you know, it, Clusters the UI and the whole thing, but by allowing people to move them off into separate plugins, we could accommodate them quite all right. So it makes everyone do what they want to do. It allows us to get out of the way. People can do what they want to do, and then still use the rest of the stuff. And so in this way, we can enable the niche features. And um, I think the most of these 600 plugins only have a small number of users, but for those people using it, it's a critical piece of the plugin. And then, so that's what we want. That is, in any large software, you, you, want, you want people to be able to fill the gap between what they'd like to do versus what's capable of. And then we want to, be, we want to enable that without asking them to you know, clutter the otherwise general purpose stuff. And this extensible silo, I think, requires less communications because every developer gets his own sandbox, which is their silo, which is their plugin to hack on. And so there's, as long as you own that, that little piece of the land, you don't have to ask anyone else for the permission to add stuff. You can just go, go at it, and then you just implement whatever you want to do with it. 
If somebody else doesn't like it, they can bring this, they, they can have their own sandbox. Right? So again, it removes to one of the needs to sort of dis discuss and collaborate between different people. Everyone, if everyone can do whatever they want to do, that's, you know, that's, there's not much to talk about. Um, or, and it also helps everyone to work at their own pace. You know, like people like me, I do the conference-driven development. So like, you know, the, if I wanted to show something in the next conference, I hack some features, I might not write tests by the time the demo exists. Some other people in the Jenkins community would be far more disciplined. They, you know, they, do, they might do, say, test-driven development. They might demand that the, every patch has the corresponding test case. But again, we could accommodate all these people with different opinions because we are simply working on different sandboxes. And um, I, like I said, the programmers are picky events. So if, if I have to see someone else's code, it's really not good for my peace of mind because I see so many ugliness that, oh, how, how, did this, how is it done this way or how is it done that way? I mean, I'm sure you have the same experience. And then to see the same thing from the other side, for someone new to the project, they no longer have to feel ashamed of potentially I guess the newbie code. I guess, you know, if anything that works, it'd be fine. And then if someone wants to, you know, if, if someone has a problem with it, let's just, just go do this stuff on their own. Um, and then I think the, the other important part is this, by creating this siloed environment, you can actually foster innovations. Because every wacky idea that people might come up with, they get a shot at the implementations. You know, the, as a new guy into the project, you don't have to sell your idea to someone else. And as a people, as an existing developer in the community like myself, I don't have to turn down anything. It's a lot easier to come across as a good guy if all you're doing is to encourage them to work on something you know, in your new plugin, as opposed to tell them that, no, I don't think we can take it because it's not, it's not general purpose enough. So there are many features in Jenkins that I originally didn't anticipate to become popular, but nonetheless they did. Right? So I mean, you, sometimes you just can't tell. And the, the other times, I think as a programmer, and maybe this is because of my, uh, my Asian origin, that I find it easier to communicate in code than communicate in English. Right? You have, I'm sure you have this experience that you have this whole thing mapped out in your head, but it's just so painful to serialize this graph of related concepts into English words and sentences and try to convince the other guy that this is something they should let me do. I, I've, been I've been contributing to many open source projects and I, I, always, I, always, I always felt this pain. Um, and also, you know, there's a little bit of ego involved, right? I mean, I should, people should by now know me or they say, like, how dare can you reject my patches kind of thing. Um, so, and uh, so I think this allowing people to experiment new things into the plugin that sort of enables people to get the job done and also allows the project to sort of foster experiments. And only after they prove themselves, we could sort of really start to highlight these things. And similarly, if some of these experiments fail, we don't have to drag these. these this plugin where the experiments were made could lie dormant. And whoever using it can keep using it, but it doesn't add on any cost to drag us down, down the road. The, another part that I really like about the extensibility is that it highlights these higher order problems. Um, the, you know, with enough silos, with things divided up into enough silos, the developer starts, the core developers also start working on plugins, like myself, again, I work on a number of Jenkins plugins. And so, Things that I, so I really get to put myself into the shoes of the plugin developers. I get to see the pains that they have to go through. And anything that I do to improve those processes, you know, be it simplifying the build process, adding the IDE support, um, writing the error checkers for the common mistakes and so on, these things all start to equally benefit every plugin developers. And so whereas if the core is the bulky piece, the work that's done on the core is not going to help the plugin by themselves. So in this way, you, can, you keep making it easier for people to write these silos, and then that makes the development more scalable. You can use a smaller number of people working in a core to support a larger number of people writing individual plugins or the silos. And that, I think, is crucial because, you know, I think we all, we, 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 we all don't have enough committers in the project. 
the, I think the, the, the other key part, and this one is not technical, but it's more of a social thing, it's by creating these silos, it allows us to drastically reduce the barrier to the entry of the project. Um, so I was, in fact, just having this conversation a few hours back in the, uh, the Jenkins stand um, that, you know, I was telling these this people that, well, in Jenkins project, you just have to tell me your GitHub ID and then you are our Jenkins committer. And then this is so much, so, I mean, it's so much so that we even write the IRC bot that adds the new people to, as a committer. Um, and, and so that's why we were able to grow to that many, you know, number of people contributing. And then you know, in many projects, I think this is, uh, this is quite, I think this is quite surprising, but this works for us partly because when one people aren't collaborating, if you don't, if you don't have to work with these people, you know, you don't really have to carefully interview these, them. You don't have to see if, you know, they are a nice fit to the existing committers. So that there's the, most of the reasons the typical projects demand a long time for someone before they become a committer is simply gone. And um, again, it's also because of the silos, any possible damage that this new committer can do is highly compartmentalized. And so it really doesn't affect that much. And also, a part of the point of using version control system is so that we can roll back changes. Um, so in fact, I can only think of like, a th two or three incidents where we had in the past where the new committer you know, made some problems or caused some confusions among existing developers. And in all but one case, we are simply able to roll back the changes they've done. You know, that, that we, we said, well, if we, ever exist, if we ever working on the plugins before, take some seniority. Just because everyone is a committer doesn't mean everyone is equal. So if, someone, if some plugin is actively maintained by some people, their opinion on the Trump others, and again, that's okay, because if the new people has a problem with it, they could simply work on a different sandbox, right? So um, in all but one cases, we were able to successfully roll it back, and then that was it. And so you know, in my mind, like for most of the projects, unless you're like a Linux kernel, the, the, the projects that we have is not having enough computers. And then, so we shouldn't be chasing people away with, uh, with the stick, but we should be instead making uh, the contribution as easy as possible by reducing the barrier to the entry. And then this coupled with the fact that the writing plugin, Jenkins plugin, I mean the Jenkins plugin is small enough, that's the main reason we were able to grow to that 600 plugin size. Yeah, and then also I noticed that when you give people new power, um, people sort of behave more cautiously. Just because they can commit to the repository doesn't mean they actually would. So they nonetheless want to make sure that they are not stepping onto someone else's code. Um, and so it really works well. And another reason this works well for the open source projects like ours is that they, when, in, when people move on, when people who did the original plugin move on to something else, this allows us to have the continuous inflow of the new developers who we'll pick up where the previous guy has left off and then keep the, you know, keep carry the flag forward. Um, and it also encourages small contributions. I think those are the ones that we want to have more often than having the massive changes that rewrites everything once every two years, right? And then I also realized that the, now that I look back, that if I, if I see the, these key contributors in the Jenkins project today, you know, they, they, they came up to the project for the first time in very casual fashion, most of them. So, you know, when, we, when you think about how to grow people into the key member of the community, you have to start somewhere. And then so, to, because you can't really tell who becomes a significant contributor, so you just have to try it with everyone. So, but with that said, so, so far I was focusing on, well, how can we do the work without any communications? But, if there's absolutely no communication whatsoever, then everyone ends up doing things in their own parts of the universe, and they fail to sort of come together into the single mass that is the, that is the community. So the, you know, the one good example that I can think of which failed to form a, a planet is the ant plugin in, the, uh, in Java build tool. So ant is a Java build tool, and then it's got excellent extensibility that allows people to write tasks. 
But so you, if you see this, like a GitHub or Google code, you see lots and lots of these little ant tasks that are written by all these different people, but there's no single community around it because there's no place to go. So they, you know, they simply reach around the world, many of them dead. So instead, what we want to have is some kind of this center of gravity that pulls people and that creates the community. And it's something that, that sort of bring all these different efforts into one thing, that's the one mass, that the, the magnificent the planet that is the Jupiter. Um, and I think in the traditional project, the source code repository is the center of gravity because, well, for, for people to, you know, to collaborate, they have to be able to commit the changes. So you create this artificial thing that's the single source code repository and then people will work around it and that becomes it. But I think it doesn't have to be that way because as I said, for all the reasons, having people co collaborate on the single code base is actually incredibly painful. So, so what are these center of gravities in the Jenkins project, right? So, well, let, let me get to some of the easy ones out of the way first. So the first one, for whatever reason, I discover that the IRC is an excellent the center of gravity. You know, it's probably because it's the closest thing we have the, to the water cooler in the open source project. It is a place that people can come to, let's say, as opposed to Twitter. It's, the, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a place that you can go to see all the others. And you can also kind of be present and absent at the same time. That, so most of the time, you're not really paying any attention to what's going on there. But if, you know, if interesting conversation starts, you could, or if somebody else talks to you, you can. And then I think this, you know, they would crack the joke and, and do some non-productive things in there, but apparently these things is very helpful for building human relationships. It helps create this context around people beyond the code, and all things go a long way in making work happen smoothly. The, other thing I think that really worked well as the center of gravity is the outreach effort. You know, I guess people here would probably know better, know this better than I am, but um, there's an incredible value in having people actually meet together and, and, and talk to each other in face to face. So we've been doing meetups around the world, you know, in Tokyo, in Sao Paulo, in, in London, in Copenhagen, and so on. We've been having hackathons so that the developers can meet each other. Um, and we also, find that it's actually incredibly important to give projects some voice. You know, having a blog that the people can come to, having a Twitter account so that when we, have to, when we want to do something, we have a means to reach to our users. And you know, for this, I have to say the, uh, the mud props to the guy who is in this picture. Uh, he's the one that spearheaded these kind of things. Because you know, I'm the guy who write code. I didn't realize how important these things are unless, until, until it actually happened. But, Above all these things, I think the most important thing that creates this gravity in the Jenkins project is the update center. It's the uh, user interface built into Jenkins that allows people to install plugins. Um, and then the flip side of it is that the, to, the, to list your plugins into this update center, you have to collocate your plugin in the, in the GitHub Jenkins CI organizations. Um, and then we make it such, so we make it so that the, the commit access, would grant, a single commit access would grant you access to all the plugin repositories, not just the one that you're working on. And so it's a way of encouraging you to start working on other plugins or start maintaining those. Um, and then once you become a committer, for the reason I mentioned earlier, you can also add other people into this project. So, the, the, thing, the reason this works in my mind is because it creates an incentive for the developers to come to this community because you know, the users, they expect, to be, they expect to install plugins, they expect to find plugins in the update center. So as a developer, naturally you want your stuff to be used by other people. That's how we derive pleasure out to writing code. Um, so you, that makes people want to come. And again, when you have this inflow of the developers, it makes it easier for us to find new maintainers. Um, and then as more plugins gather in the update center, the expectation from the users that they find things in the update center gets stronger. So it creates a positive feedback cycle, which is exactly like a gravity. So initially it starts small, but as, as it accumulates more plugins and as the users start to see more value in it, 
it creates this vicious cycle that brings in more people into the community and accelerates the whole process. Um, and then so also, the initially, right, the, the other part that makes this gravity stronger over time is that the, this mechani mechanism behind the scene to create and run the update center gets better over time because we invest in terms of the coding. And so now, so, you know, we built the mirroring mechanism, we built the, the, um, the statistics stuff built in, we created the issue trackers that link to the documentation and so on. So all these things done over time make up this center a very valuable place that's very hard to replace. You know, with the distributed version control system, you can very easily move the source code repository elsewhere. But this kind of graph center of gravity that is the update center and the fact that, you know, we have the, all this mess of people in one community, that's something you can't really move to another place. And that creates this community. That's, that's in my mind, is the center of the community. So on this topic, I have to say there is this one emerging challenge for which I don't have answer for. Um, back then we designed this whole thing, we were still in the subversion repository. Right? Um, and then since then we've moved off to Git, as is probably many of you. Um, and you know, back then, the, the fact that the subversion was centralized was also acting as a part of the, the gravity. Because you know, for, again, for you to, it was, well, it was just way too painful to maintain custom patches on top of somebody else's subversion repository. So if someone wanted to make changes to the plugins, they really wanted to you know, do so in the upstream repository that is in the community. But with Git, it's surprisingly easy to uh, maintain your own patches and then keep it in parallel with what the upstream is doing. So there's a somewhat less of an incentive for you to join the project. I think the another thing is the pull requests that had some profound impact on these dynamics in the community. You know, on one hand, it's great that the contributions are easier. So in fact, we, we receive a lot of pull requests so much so that we can't even keep up with. But, but also, it creates this mentality that, that, sort of, you know, that, that lets people throw the stuff over the wall. You know, they think the work is done where they contributed the pull request, but in reality, someone in the project will have to take a look at it and then it has to, the patch needs to be brought to the completion. That's a lot of work. And you know, when, when we also, and also when we enable a contribution without them joining the community, it sort of reduces the inflow of the developers. So there's a lot of people who is contributing to Jenkins project by sending us pull requests, but they don't see themselves as the member of the, of the community because they don't, they don't belong there. And then so we have, we, you know, we, we are getting less, less, less new people in the community, which makes it harder over time to maintain those things. So this is something I don't have a good answer for. I generally like it and all that, but um, this is something I need to figure out. Okay, so um, really, the, all I'm trying to say is that, you know, you gotta scale the development, right? The, in the open source project, we don't have enough people, we need more code to be written, the extensibility would enable us to do that. And then, the, you know, we can reduce the amount of communication we have to do through the extensibility. We can let people do whatever they want to do with extensibility. We can get out of the way. Um, we can get out of the way between people and what they want to do with extensibility. Maybe all I'm trying to say is just extensibility, 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 extensibility. And I hopefully I made this deep on cloud. Um, so that's really all I'm trying to say here, the extensivity. Thank you very much. So, have we any questions? Anybody wish to ask a question? No? Uh-oh, I hope I... <laughs> I hope I did it that way. Anyway, yeah. well, I okay. hope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, enjoy the rest of the FOSTEM, and thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's.